you've got a lot to do. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little less on your mind? I'd Bailey can take the pressure off your day-to-day -day accounting, taxes, data issues, and other business needs. What inspires you inspires us. This is the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast brought to you by Art Wiederman, CPA with Ide Bailey. Whether it's taxes and investing or planning wisely, Art is the expert to make your dental practice profitable. At Ide Bailey, what inspires you inspires us. We provide a suite of accounting and advisory services dedicated to the total care of your practice. Visit our website to access our tools and resources tailored for dentists, idebailey.com slash dentist. That's E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com slash dentist. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Art Wiederman, CPA, and Ide Bailey, LLP are not rendering legal, accounting, or other professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information or opinions shared. If you have questions and or feedback, make sure to email Art over at awiederman at idebailey.com. That's A-W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com. You can also give Art a call at 657-279-3243. Without further delay, here's your host, Dental CPA, Art Wiederman. And hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman, CPA. I'm your host, Art Wiederman. Welcome to my podcast. Uh, we have a beautiful, sunny May afternoon here in Southern California, and uh, got a lot to share with you before we get to our very special guest today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit. I've not only had our first uh, Dental CPA, Academy of Dental CPA meeting in two and a half years in Napa, um, late last month and early this month. Uh, it was wonderful to see all my friends and also uh, got to lecture at the California Dental Association Convention. We'll talk a little bit about that. My guest today is Dr. Ed Zuckerberg, and Dr. Zuckerberg is going to talk to you uh, today about his expertise, which is social media marketing and also um, using technology in your practice. Uh, we'll get to Dr. Zuckerberg in a minute because he's got a lot of great stuff to tell you about. Um, but first I want to tell you about my marketing partner, uh, decisions in dentistry magazine, wonderful, wonderful company. Um, if you haven't looked at their magazine, www.decisionsindentistry.com, they have 140 continuing education courses at a very, very reasonable price and some of the best clinical content in America. Again, go to www.decisionsindentistry.com. As I mentioned, our mothership, um, the Academy of Dental CPAs, which is now 25 member firms. We added a, a wonderful new firm in the state of Alabama, uh, www.adcpa.org. If you're looking for a dental CPA, we at I'm a dental division director at the CPA firm of Ide Bailey. I'm out of Tustin, California. We work with about 300 dentists in our office in Tustin, about 1,000 throughout the firm in the Western U.S., so you can get a hold of me at 657-279-3243 or A. Wiederman, W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at idebailey.com. So I'm going to start off a little bit about the um, couple things. Number one, if you guys are going to be, if any of you are going to be in Florida at the National Academy of General Dentistry meeting, I will be, be doing a full day program there in Orlando, Florida on July the 28th. Uh, we're going to spend half the day talking about metrics in a dental practice, the numbers, and how we can find some profit holes in your practice, make you some more money. And the other half of the day is going to be a lecture on financial planning for dentists. So if you're going to be there, come by. If you're a podcast listener, I would love to meet you. Um, I had We had our meeting at uh, in Napa at the Silverado Resort, uh, played the Silverado golf course, didn't break any course records, but had a really good time. And uh, we had some great speakers. We had a wonderful lady named Rita Zamora, who actually, uh, Rita also works in social media marketing, and she is actually uh, the lady that introduced me to Dr. Zuckerberg, who you'll meet in a minute. Um, we had Rachel Wall from Inspired Hygiene uh, talk. But my, one of my favorite lecturers was a gentleman by the name of Alan Spector, and we're going to have Alan on the podcast coming up here. 
He wrote a book called Your Retirement Quest, 10 Secrets for Creating and Living a Full Fulfilled Retirement. And it's not about how much money do you have, but what are you going to do when you retire? And that's a that's a big deal. Um, got several other folks. I've got one of my clients who's a dental anesthesiologist. We're going to talk about incorporating that into your practice. We're going to be talking to our investment folks at I'd Bailey, talk about what are going on in these, what's going on in these crazy markets and all that stuff. So we did that and we got a lot of that coming on. So I got a lot of great podcasts coming up for you uh, to get into the middle and towards the end of 2022. We're going to be doing a three-part webinar series uh, on uh, metrics and uh, some uh, management and tax planning towards the end of the year. I'll have some more details for that as we go along here, as well as a three-part transition series. And um, got to lecture at the California Dental Association Convention in Anaheim. We have a booth there every year. And I also spoke to uh, a number of dentists on uh, helping them buy a practice. So that was really fun for me. Be sure to check out our new I'd Bailey podcast, Ebb and Flow, a business podcast providing inspired insight on issues and trends the middle market faces. Hear unique business stories, get answers to frequently asked and unasked questions, and understand business topics that matter to you. Available now on your favorite podcast platform. Today, my guest and I am honored to have Dr. Ed Zuckerberg. Uh, you might rec uh, recognize the name. His son, Mark, was the founder of Facebook. But Dr. Zuckerberg has a whole resume behind him and has taken his second career after practicing dentistry uh, in helping dentists with social media marketing and also incorporating um, uh, incorporating technology into uh, their practices. So I'll just tell you a little bit, and then I'm going to let him tell you a lot more. Uh, Dr. Zuckerberg graduated from the NYU College of Dentistry in 1978. He actually grew up about two miles from where I grew up. We were rivals. He went to Midwood High School. I went to Madison High School, so we had a lot of great conversation about that. So from 1981 to 2013, Dr. Zuckerberg owned his own dental practice in Dobbs Ferry, New York, right outside of Yonkers, outside of New York City, where he pioneered many painless techniques uh, to help patients who suffered from dental fears and anxiety. And he has always been an early adapter of technology advances in the field. And it was one of the first practices to convert to digital radiography and paperless records. Uh, he does that type of consulting as well as helping doctors with uh, social media marketing issues, which he is probably as qualified as anybody in the country to do. So Dr. Ed Zuckerberg, it's an honor and a privilege to have you on the Art of Dental Finance and Management. It's great to be on the show, Art. Thanks for well, having me. Well, thank you. And and we got to know each other a little bit, uh, I think, uh, last week, or I think it was last week or the week before. And um, so one of the interesting questions I have, and we're, we're not going to dwell on this, but you have you shared with me you have four children. Um, I, as I mentioned, one of them started uh, Facebook. And uh, did any of them, uh, I don't think any of them are in the dental profession. Did any of them express any kind of an interest in following dad's footsteps? You know, I really tried to give them the opportunity, exposed, and, and because I had the office in the house, at one point or another, they all had a chance to help out in some capacity, um, pouring models, you know, crafting uh, temporaries with me, or doing some lab work around the office, that kind of thing, basic filing. They heard lots of stories about what went on in the office with patients and Good and bad. Uh, my wife also worked in the office, even though she initially trained as a psychiatrist. She left her profession after 10 years. Um, I made her an offer that she couldn't refuse to come work <laughs> in the home-based practice and be around the children. And uh, she might have been the most overqualified, uh, you know, office manager. But um, it, she proved in, to be an invaluable asset to the practice, running everything non-clinical, and really showed me how much there is to managing staff and really understanding the uh, how to treat people as patients and really how to understand what their needs were. So with our focus on patients with phobias, we were able to collaborate and really develop techniques for every single kind of phobia you can think of. And 
you know, we encountered some that Dennis would not even have a clue that such a phobia exists. Of course, they're all they're all triggers of bad dental experiences. For example, I bet you didn't know there was a phobia of Highlights magazine. <laughs> that, that was the one that, that when I was a kid, I get I got to color in, right? Yes, and they had like um among other things, they had find uh, what's different in two pictures. Right, right, right. And 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 for some reason, dentists were targets of Highlight Magazine. Every I, dentist, I had no idea. Point, every dentist at some point or another got bombarded with free copies of Highlights until they bought a subscription. Or if you uh, never bought a subscription, you had free copies. You just had to tear out the advertising inserts inside, <laughs> and put them in your waiting room, and we had a gal who um, her mother confessed had not been to the dentist since she was four. And she was now 19 and had terrible, terrible toothaches. And my, wife spent, my wife spent about four sessions on the phone with her, convincing her that we would you know, really be gentle and take care of her. And she finally got the courage up to come in and she walked into the office. And the first thing she saw was a highlight magazine. And she immediately crumpled up into the floor in a heap and started sobbing uncontrollably because the, one of the things she remembered from her last dental experience when she was four was the Highlights magazine. And the oh, magazine. my. So, so she stayed? That was, she the last time, that was the last time we had Highlights in the dental I, office. I would, I, I would, well, I had no idea. So it's, see, after 38 years in the dental profession, I learned something new every single day. Oh, my goodness. That's hysterical. So uh, tell us a little bit about your journey. I mean, you you had your own private practice for 32 years. And tell us about your journey. So um, out of dental school, I did a, um, a general practice residency in the Veterans Hospital in Brooklyn, New York. It was sure. a terrific year for me. They had um, lost their oral surgery accreditation. They had a senior who was graduating. Um, but he was overwhelmed, so he invited the general practice residents, there were three of us, to do more than the um, allotted half day a week of oral surgery. I wound up spending about 50% of my residency doing oral surgery. But during that year, I think I charted that I extracted over 500 teeth, including um, horizontal and full bony impactions of wisdom teeth. We did apicoectomies on every root of every tooth you can imagine just to get the practice on them. Um, apicoectomies on palatal roots of maxillary second molars, things of that nature. We did the forward osteotomies where we moved entire jaws. Um, so it was quite a surgical platform for me and the result is that when I went into my own practice, um, just three months out of my residency, I was very confident. I mean, I had the confidence of a dentist who'd been in dental practice for like 10 years. And yeah, residencies, my, my doctors who go through residencies seem to be, a st- not, not the ones that don't do it that are, that are not, but they just seem to be a step above. Well, I mean, it wasn't required. It wasn't mandated in dentistry when I graduated in 78. And many of my colleagues went straight into practice, of course, which meant that you did a total of five root canals in your life, maybe (laughs) half a dozen extractions, and probably half of those the instructor held your hand while you were removing the tooth. So uh, the result was that a lot of dentists did basic bread and butter dentistry and referred anything of a specialty nature out. Um, whereas we, I kind of kept everything in house for a while, mm-hmm. except for, I mean, I didn't have any training in orthodontics. Um, so I didn't do any banded ortho, although when Invisalign came out in 2000, I was a um, uh, an early Invisalign provider and I was a premier provider for 13 years. Um, now I'm actually getting candid clear aligner therapy in my own mouth and consulting for that company. So that's kind of interesting how that's come full circle. Um, But over over the years, um, I started practicing in Brooklyn. We got, I got married 
um, that first year of private practice in 1979. And my wife got into medical school in Westchester County, New York. So we moved to Westchester County from Brooklyn. I commuted, which was not an easy thing, about an hour each way. Uh, I, but we I really, agree. really liked Westchester. And about a year later, we started looking for a house. Um, and we found a house that was being sold by a retiring dentist who had a small dental practice in the house. Oh, is that right? And I figured I would work there a couple of days a week and four days a week in Brooklyn helped me pay for the mortgage on the new house. And I liked it so much that about four or five years later, we did a major renovation on the house, adding um, out to both the dental office and more living space upstairs. And in about 1989 or 90, I sold my office in Brooklyn to practice exclusively in the house where I had the opportunity to be with family um, at, at a normal dinner hour, spend time after dinner with the family, tuck everybody in, and then go downstairs and finish all my paperwork and get my, my work done during optimal time for me when the phone didn't ring and there were no distractions. And uh, I was blessed with not needing a ton of sleep. So, <laughs> you know, I often wouldn't go to bed before 1 or one thirty, And uh, all I had to do since I had no commute was to wake up at 7.30 in the morning for an 8 o'clock patient and just kind of roll out of bed and right down into the office. I've been working at home since the pandemic started for two years, and I don't miss an hour and a half round trip commute. And I get to get up and have breakfast with my wonderful wife, Lynn, who she and I celebrated our 37th wedding anniversary a couple of days ago. So I think you're five years ahead of me. So, um, so after you so after you got out of dentistry, you started. Uh, you didn't just go and sit in a rocking chair and watch all my children every day. You started doing a bunch of other stuff. Tell us a little bit about what you've. Uh, in the last uh, eight or nine or 10 years, what you've been doing? Well, we always wondered where we might wind up in our so-called retirement. Um, I'm still waiting for that retirement to happen. But, <laughs> you know, with four kids, you kind of like want to see how they wind up, you know, and maybe pick a geography that's maybe not your own choosing, but maybe one that's in synergy with everyone else. Um, so I guess Mark was first to move to California in 2004 after he dropped out of Harvard and started Facebook. About a year and a half later, he convinced his oldest sister, Randy, who actually did graduate Harvard um, and was working in marketing first for Ogilvy and Mather and then for Forbes. And he convinced her to come out to uh, California and run the marketing program at Facebook. So is Mark the oldest? Mark is eldest, second oldest. He has three second sisters. Oldest. Okay. He's number two out of four. Um, so Randy's the oldest. And then our youngest, Ariel, um, started college in Claremont McKenna in Southern California in 2007. Great school. Around Great the school. Time, around the time that things started coming together, when she graduated in 2011, she um, she had a, uh, a major in philosophy and public policy and a minor in computer science. And she wound up getting a job for a startup in Palo Alto. Yep. So we now found ourselves in 2011 with three out of four kids living in Palo Alto. Our fourth was pursuing a PhD in classics at Princeton on the East Coast. was still living nearby to us. Um, but she was amenable to finishing up the last year of her PhD on the West Coast. And her husband at the time was a techie. And my youngest daughter recruited him to work for her firm. Um, and around the same time, Randy had her first child, our first grandchild. And I'll tell you, the kids weren't getting us out on the West Coast, but when that, my wife held that first grandchild 11 years ago, Almost, almost this month, 11 years ago, the night he was born, and she looked at me and said, I'm staying. Are you coming? 
Um, I, I've heard that. I, I've been to that movie before. I've heard that story. So yeah. uh, let me go out on a limb and I know the answer. You now live in Northern California. Yeah, that is correct. So <laughs> it, it, it was about a two year transition because selling a home and a dental office in one is not an easy task. No. And, and I think my strategy might have included hoping that one of the kids would take over the practice. But, uh, you know, we that were not well, they, they, I, I think they, I think they turned out okay. They did fine. <laughs> they did fine. <laughs> Maybe uh, just a little bit. So, I was Dr. Get, go ahead. I was able to get one of my previous associates to buy the home and practice after two years. So, I had a two year transition where I went back and forth. And around the same time, um, I think it was late 2010, I got a call from Howard Ferran. Yes. And I did not know Howard personally at the time, but. Howard was an early adopter, as we know. Dental Town was essentially a social network even before Facebook or even MySpace in the early 2000s. And uh, Howard called me up and said, hey, Ed, I, I figured out that Mark's dad was a dentist and you might be able to help me with the problem I'm having. Uh, I want to be friends with every dentist in the world and Facebook's telling me I can't have any more friends. And I said, well, that doesn't sound right, Howard. You could have as many people like your page as you want in the millions. Obama, who was president at the time, had something like 4 million fans on Facebook. You too right. can, Howard. And he goes, well, I got this message that you've got 5,000 friends and you can't have any more. And I said, ah, it sounds like you set up your presence on Facebook as a personal profile instead of a business page. I said, we can help you with that if you'd like. I can help you <laughs> convert that to a business page. And so... I have connections at Facebook. Howard, Howard was thrilled. And he said, you need to write an article for Dental Town. So in September of 2010, my article, Does My Office Need a Facebook Page, appeared in, in Dental Town. And it was quite well received. So I got a... Um, a uh, request to do a follow-up article a few months later. Well, what are you passionate about in dentistry? And I said, well, I'm a really good dentist, but I'm not going to, I'm not one to teach dentists how to do dentistry, but, but I think I know a thing or two about the business end and integrating technology because I've always been an early adopter. I mean, I had the first IBM PC XT in my office in 1985. Wow. That was when the, the computer had a 10 megabyte hard drive and 512K RAM, a computer that I dropped $5,000 for plus another $5,000 for garbage dental practice management software. <laughs> and 10,000 was no small money for me in 1985 as a solo dentist with only in practice for four years and a wife in medical school who I was paying tuition out of current income for. Oh. Oh, brutal, brutal. So, um, I mean, it wasn't, it was only about 11 or 12,000 at the time, you know, not the uh, six figures like it is now to go to professional school, but still it was, uh, it was a big chunk, but, and, and, it, you know, it, it was kind of, I followed my gut. I followed my, um, my vision. And, uh, you know, when I first saw the AccuCam intraoral camera, just a few years later in the late 80s, I had one of those. I was convinced it would pay for itself many times over helping me convince patients to accept their treatment plans when they could visualize and see what was going on better. Um, in line with our treatment of phobic patients, we had this air abrasion unit that we put in the office in the early 90s to help us do small pit and fissure and class one carries. Um, without pain or injections. Um, I was pretty much the first kid on the block to have digital x-ray in 1998. Uh, in 2004, when I had this desire with a 25-year-old practice virtually and a ton of charts with, that were super thick, which I guess is a benefit and a curse. It means that you've got patients coming to you for many years and they're not switching to other doctors. <laughs> But when you try and find something in a really thick chart with a ton of papers, it's brutal. 
And yeah. I decided I wanted to convert everything digitally. And there were absolutely no systems for digital in dentistry in 2004. So I got my, um, not my son, but my son-in-law to help me. Um, and we built our own um, EHR for our practice. Um, and uh, basically scanned everything and went fully digital almost 20 years ago. In, in 2008, uh, CAD in the office. So um, it became a natural for me. And Henry Schein also reached out to me. A lot of uh, dental conferences and dental schools reached out to me to lecture, um, which I did. For, for years. Um, I also worked with private offices, with dental associations, helping them with their social media presence. And I also got approached by a lot of companies with ideas for products and needed help with building their business plans, you know, helping them build a better product, bringing in other key opinion leaders to help them grow their product. And of course, help them get funding. Um, my youngest daughter, Ariel, is now in venture capital, and she helped me establish a lot of connections with companies um, who, you know, helped some of my companies that I was advising. All right, so you're you're a busy guy, and a lot you got a lot of information to share, and and I'm excited to. Talk to you. I want to start talking about the social media stuff. And, and on your website, uh, you talk about, uh, Dr. Zuckerberg, how you want to have dentists use social media to show off some of the stuff to patients and prospective patients that's not obvious to them when they visit an office. So what, what does that mean, show, showing off the stuff to them? How, how are we going to use social media to do that? And then let's get into the discussion of, 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 of you know, how dentists should be using social media. That's what I want to talk about today. And I wish I had 10 hours to talk to you because you got so well, much great information. In my, my early lectures in 2010 through 2013 were geared at just helping dentists build a Facebook presence. Now everybody's got them, but what are they doing with them? And um, the golden years are gone for social media. The easy years, the early adopters really uh, reaped a lot of benefits. First of all, you can reach your audience for almost no cost. Um, and, you know, it was kind of easy. There are a lot of tools. Um, patients were kind of captive audiences. Once they liked your page, you were able to target market to their friends on Facebook, which for years was the most powerful tool that Facebook had and, and one that, I espoused and which, you know, most of the dental public really didn't take advantage of the fact that each person on Facebook roughly has about 300 to 350 friends on average. You know, of course, you've got people with a couple of thousand and then you've got grandma may only have 20, you know, her grandkids and a couple of people she's reconnected with from her high school or college days. Um, but 350 is a pretty good number to work with. Okay. And that means that if you've got as few as a thousand people who are fans of your Facebook page, you've got a potential reach of 350,000 word of mouth referrals. Now, I go back to the days when referrals were earned when someone who needed a dentist happened to ask someone who was a satisfied patient of yours, hey, do you have a good dentist in the area? You know, I'm new to the area or I don't like my current dentist or something. And they were like, yeah, Dr. Zuckerberg's a good guy. We've been with him a while, you know, and um, you, should go you, see should him. Out, you know, and, and um, if you happen to be lucky because there was no internet back then and they couldn't look you up and do a search, if you happen to be lucky, that person happened to have your business card, which they handed to that person so they could connect with your office. Um, you know, it, it's funny because when I lecture to the dental schools now, 
I actually keep an old copy of the yellow pages. <laughs> and, and then when I talk about marketing to the, to the young people who are at USC, UCLA, Loma Linda, Western in our area, I, I'll, hold, I'll hold up the book and I'll go, so, so how many of you look up professional services on the yellow pages? And I do it not because I'm expecting people to raise their hands, but I, it's just fun for me to look at the, and they look at me, they look at me like, are you insane? <laughs> I don't even think I've, I think they've given up. I don't even think I've gotten a mail copy dropped off. In my I, I haven't in, in several years, years. But, um, but you know, the fact of the matter is that um, nowadays the key is getting likes on your social media page yep. and marketing techniques are geared at getting likes. And once you've got a like of, a, of an individual on your page, not only do you have a way to market to them and tell them what's going on in your office, but you have a way to access their network of 350 people. And when they do, when you, when you tap into their network, and there are obviously lots of different techniques and ways to do that, but now you're kind of passively getting that word of mouth marketing that used to require an in-person reaction now can occur passively just by harnessing that power of social media. So, so if we're talking to a dentist who's listening, now anybody probably under the age of 40, maybe go get a cup of coffee or something. No, not really. Don't do that. Uh, but we're talking to a dentist who's first time, they've, they've never really done any social media marketing. Okay, where do they start? I mean, do they go to Facebook first? Do they go to Instagram? What, what, if you were consulting with somebody, what would you tell them? Where do they start? You know, years ago, I would have, and, and I did obviously teach from scratch and advocate for the dentist to take an active hands-on role. Nowadays, I think it's critical for practices to have a marketing manager in their practice. It's a full-time okay. position. It's a full-time position. I agree. I absolutely and agree with you. The dentist needs to understand. So they need to listen to a few lectures so they really understand the power of social media marketing. Um, and what I do often is I'll, um, dentists will reach out to me and I'll say, look, I'm not a Freudian. You can't count on me to be holding your hand on this for years. And I, I, I can't take on that many new people. But I'll work with an office for like three months. I'll work, I'll speak to the staff, I'll speak to the doc and explain pitfalls and things to watch out for, like um, never make anyone but yourself the admin of your Facebook page. I can't tell you how many times I get a call. My office manager and I had a, a bad divorce mm -hmm. and my office manager was the only one that knew the password or the way to get into the Facebook page. And I'm locked out of my own Facebook page now. And I'm sorry, I can't help with that. Right. Um, even my friends, and I know people in places at the company. <laughs> yeah, I would think you do. <laughs> they can't help with that situation. Wow. So what about, what about my clients who are in their 50s and their 60s, maybe the uh, gray hairs or approaching gray hairs, maybe uh, where you yeah. and I might be? Yeah, I, I, I have. Uh, you, you, you know, know about Eric. A year ago, a lot of those people said, I'm not messing with this stuff. I'm pretty close to retirement. But look at what happened to their the stock market this year. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, a lot of people are now rethinking their retirement strategy and thinking that, hey, I'm going to be working for a while. I better figure out this social media. So, stuff. so what do you say? What, so what do you say to someone who's 50 or 60 who doesn't understand? I don't know how to get on Facebook. I don't know what Instagram is. What's Twitter? I don't. How do you what, what do you say to them? Do they have to do this? Get a young person to handhold them. And exactly. Walk them through, okay. But the bottom line is, it's like a dentist. We are taught in dental school how to do crowns. We actually make them from scratch, the whole laboratory procedure and everything. Once we graduate, I would venture to guess that 99.5% of all dentists never make another crown the rest of their life. They use a dental laboratory. Right. In the same way, a dentist should know best practices for social media, and it's something they can learn rather easily, um, but we don't expect them to be the ones doing it. 
They're, they should either have their own internal marketing person or hire an outside marketing firm to handle it for them. I think that's Again, a, I, You want to know what's going on. Idea. You want to understand best practices. And a lot of the younger dentists, as you mentioned, there's a, a big difference in the way older dentists and younger dentists approach this. A lot of younger dentists do want to do the hands-on stuff. And I actually get a lot of calls from a lot of younger dentists really wanting to learn some of the finer points. Well, I, if you don't know the finer points, I don't know who's going to. I think the, my, my, my joke is always the reason I had children was to teach me all this social media stuff. Uh, you, you, you have, you absolutely got it from your children, but, uh, let, let's talk about, we talk about a dentist connection to the community and, and I've always been one Dr. Zuckerberg who's believed that we have to show us as human being people, not just a robot who cuts crowns, uh, that, that we're involved in the community. What, talk about the, the link between social media and a dentist connection to the community. Why is that important? You know, practice has changed a lot over the years, um, and technology has a lot to do with it. It's really made our way of doing practice much more efficient. So, for example, pre-1998, before I can converted to digital radiography, if I had a new patient scheduled and I had to have a full series of x-rays done, um, I would have about 15 minutes of downtime where I could do an exam, but I really don't know the guts of what's going on until the assistant who took the x-rays, or if I took them myself, they had to get put through the machine to be developed. They had to be mounted and whatnot. And that 15 minute time often was an opportunity to develop some rapport, learn a little bit about the patient, have the patient learn a little bit about you. Um, now, things are very businesslike. The patient really doesn't get to spend a lot of time with the doctor that's not businesslike, you know, really just getting right down to work because our systems are so efficient that services that are not the actual practice of dentistry are, are delegated to other staff members. And when the doc sits down, he's ready to anesthetize and start working. Right. So um, the Facebook page of a practice often becomes a, the opportunity for the office to really um, highlight certain things that are going on in the practice or behind the scenes stuff that the patients may not really know about the practitioner. You know, maybe offices, lots of my offices, for example, do stuff like they, they shut their office down for a week each year and they take the entire staff um, to Haiti to do missionary work or, or pro bono dentistry on people in Haiti. Uh, the patients who have to wait for an appointment may find out, but if you're in between a cycle, you may not even know that the office does that. And that's something that the office wants to broadcast on their social media page. Um, if you've got staff members who are doing, you know, great work at the local church or synagogue um, or, or anything interesting, you know, or highlight a staff member's, you know, maybe a unique hobby that a staff member has. Um, I had a doctor in the state of Washington who used to race horses. <laughs> it, maybe 50 percent of the content on his facebook page was about his racehorses you know wow. it's if a lot of his patients were interested and it was his way of not bogging down too much time in the practice with stories by letting them know what's going on with his horse racing stable on his facebook page and another doctor of mine who i do some work for now who's a periodontist down in pompano beach um just got nominated for a community service award because he was on his way home from the office one day and he saw somebody slumped over behind the seat of a car, an old elderly gentleman. And fortunately, the door was open. And he was able to detect that the person was, you know, not breathing. And he immediately called 911 and started CPR. And he got nominated by one of the people in the community for being an outstanding neighbor, citizen, whatnot. So... I'm in the process of helping him craft a little social media story on how to uh, show that side of the doctor. 
you know, and, and the doc, what the, you know, what things they may not know about the doctor outside of the office that portray a human side. When the, when the patients see the human side of the doctor and the staff members, they connect and relate better to the staff members and feel um, more of a, of a bond with that practice. We had a client in the CPA practice, Dr. Zuckerberg, and he was, I believe it was in the state of Utah. And he uh, had found out about a young 13-year-old boy who had been horribly bullied at school and beaten up. It was horrible. And so they found out about it. And the practice decided, and obviously the mouth was just totally destroyed by these horrible, horrible bullies. So this doctor completely for free reconstructed this young young man's mouth and they used social media and they told me they got 500 new patients in six months yeah i mean that's what you're talking about right is, is, yeah, is I, I i know offices that select you know one patient a year that they do a yeah. complete makeover you know start to finish and uh, all pro bono and they get publicity from the local press um, they get lots of applications from people who want to be the candidate for the next year. And, you know, it shows that the office is concerned and that they're not, you know, it's not all about money, that they really, you know, have a, um, a good side, good heart to the side to that. And it also, um, if the staff is involved in the project and even brainstorming ideas. If, if maybe it was the staff concept, an idea to do a pro bono case like that every year. Now, the fact that you implement it and shows that your staff is empowered, that you listen to them, you take suggestions from them, and um, it makes the staff feel better about working in that practice, too. So what are some of the, and then once I we get through this topic, I want to ask you to talk a little bit about what you're doing and maybe how some of the folks might be able to reach out to you. But what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see dentists making in their social media marketing? So I see a lot of offices using canned content that doesn't relate to their practice, you know, kind of like, you know, did you know, like bland facts about gum disease or bland facts about, um, you know, toothbrushes and, you know, sometimes, you know, filler content is good. You want to be, you want to have content out there in front of the public, but that's not the kind of content that people are going to engage with. They may look at it, glance over it. Um, Facebook, on Facebook to succeed, content is king. You need to get people to engage with your content and engaging means they need to like the post. They need to comment on the post. They need to click on the post if the post is a link to an article that you find interesting. Or they need to share the post with their friends. Um, those are the only actions people can take that Facebook can actually measure as engagement. And obviously, Facebook is a public company. They earn money from users seeing ads, charging advertisers a premium for ads. And the place where people see content is called their newsfeed. And if the average person has 350 friends and another 75 to 100 businesses that they follow, that's 450 or so different sources that are putting content into their newsfeed. And Facebook needs to put some kind of order to the content that they see to make their experience on Facebook enjoyable so that they will stay on the site longer. The longer they stay on the site, the more money Facebook makes in terms of advertising. Right. So the way Facebook does that is by assigning each content, each piece of content gets a score. And the score for each person is different. It'll be based on, you know, who you, what content you see might be based on how often you interact with a particular person or business's page. 
Um, if it's someone in your family who you mark as a close friend, obviously you're going to see them, their content at the top. Um, if it's an advertiser or a, a business that you are a fan with who boosts the content in the page by paying money, that will get the content to be seen by more people. Um, but the way to do it effectively, even if you're paying for it and even if you're not, is to have good quality content that people will engage with and that Facebook can measure the success. Because even with, 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 with good content that we don't pay for, that we don't boost, if we then decide after running it, say, on our page for a week and we see that it gets a lot of engagement, and we now decide to boost it to get even more engagement and go beyond just having the people who are fans of our page see it, but go out to the people who are their friends to see it by extension, um, then Facebook will actually reward us for having good content by charging less for that post, which has what we call warm content or established proof you know, proof content that people have it, will engage with this content. And Facebook will charge less for that than cold content, which has no measurable engagement stats for Facebook to go by. So if a doctor, Dr. Zuckerberg, if a doctor wants fee-for-service patients, or they want to, I was, I was talking to a doctor, a client of mine, who was telling me that when he was doing his social media, he was focusing and targeting people who had this type of insurance or that type of insurance. And, and I guess you can do that. But if, if you're targeting like fee-for-service patients, there are ways to do that on Facebook? There are ways to target, um, for example, people who work for a specific employer. If you notice you've got um, someone from a particular job and maybe they, um, you know, maybe they've got a terrific dental plan and they refer one or two people in. So now you've got like three people from the company in the page, uh, in the practice. Um, you can run a campaign and target only employers of that company in the campaign. Um, and, you know, you can even work with the HR person from that company and say, hey, we've got a few of your uh, employees here. Um, I'm willing to offer this incentive or that incentive if you, you know, maybe want to work with me and, and people come in and looking for, re you know, referrals to a local dentist, something like that. Um, there are all kinds of ways that we can target people um, in geographic locales, people who are highest socioeconomic stat status, you know, homeowners, people with higher levels of college degree, you know, that kind of higher educational levels. And, and so in that way, via our targeting programs, we can select an audience. There's also, um, you know, something that Facebook is touting right now, which is called lookalike audience. So the success of a lookalike audience starts with getting as many patients of your practice on your Facebook page. Okay. And one of the tools that I find that very few dentists are using, which they should be using, is called a custom audience creation. So you can basically extract data. And this is all anonymous. You're not, you're not giving anyone's information out to Facebook or anything else. And say you extract the file from your practice management software of all the cell phone numbers of all the patients in your practice. And you create a custom audience of that group of, 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 of all your patients. And you upload it to Facebook. And Facebook will take these, so, these cell phone numbers and match them with existing Facebook users with those cell phone numbers who are going to be wow. your patients, okay? And this is all free to do. And now you have a custom audience that you can market to, which are people who are already patients in the practice. 
and you can incentivize them, a lot of times it's just a question of not even thinking about liking your office Facebook page. And when they're on Facebook and they'll get in their newsfeed a message from your office encouraging them to um, like the page, it won't take much for them to stay abreast of what's going on in the office. So they might explore the page and see the content there. And if they think it's worthwhile, they'll like the page. And once you've got them as a fan, now you have the ability to market to them and market to their friend basis, their 350 friends. But beyond that, Facebook will take your, your fans. They'll do a, um, a comparison across other non-fans of your page who fit your parameters, say your geographic area of your practice, and they will pick out characteristics of other people who are like your patients. So if you've got a predominantly, for example, a predominantly um, you know, high net worth income kind of patient base in your practice, the lookalike audience that Facebook's going to create for you is going to be patients with similar characteristics. So there are ways to do this. There are ways if I'm looking for HMO patients or, 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 or for lack of a better term, welfare dental patients, I can find them. So Facebook is, is an incredibly, I mean, I knew this, but an incredibly powerful tool. I don't have to advertise for your son's company. It does pretty well on its own. But the fact is, is that I think a lot of people don't know this and working with someone like, and I'll mention Rita Zamora again, because she's my dear friend and she's the one who introduced me to you. And she's, she's actually uh, amazing when it comes to social media marketing. Someone like that knows all this, right? Dr. Zuckerberg. And that's who we need to get to work with it. Absolutely. Rita is an incredibly um, great knowledge resource. Yeah. So let's take a second because, I, again, I, we're, we're, I, it's hard to say we're getting towards the end of our time together. Uh, talk a little bit about what you do, how dentists can get a hold of you, what you do. And, and, and quickly, you have, a, you have one of the companies you're working with that you're very passionate about. So talk about how people, you know, what do you do to help dentists? I know you, you've been very kind with your time to lots and lots of dentists across the country. And, and also this, uh, I know that there's a, uh, a a product that's being developed that that regarding the link between periodontal disease and Alzheimer's, which is horrible. Um, talk a little bit about that for a second. Sure, I'd love to. Um, so obviously during the pandemic, I haven't been out lecturing for quite a while now. I, did, I, I was out in October in Phoenix um, at the Dental Economics Conference. Um, and, and I've been doing a lot of virtual stuff. Um, but most of the work I'm doing now, the last three, four years, is working with startups. And, and about a year ago, I got introduced to one company that, um, you know, really, literally had to hold myself from falling off my chair. You know, having been a dentist, every dentist knows that there's an oral systemic connection. Um, we've all seen people who didn't take care of their mouth, um, you know, who suffered from some diseases that we, you know, obviously it's not a large enough sample size and we don't do research in our offices, but I, I've seen um, women with bacterial infections in their mouth lose babies prematurely in the seventh, eighth month. I've seen um, people with fulminating periodontal disease in their 30s and early 40s who refused treatment. And then I found out that they um, passed away from a heart attack at a, at a ridiculously early age. Um, so, you know, we have a strong premonition and we were all taught about the bacterial nature of periodontal disease. But until I, I met the work I met the team at Keystone Bio and understood the work they're doing, focusing on one particular bacteria, um, Porphyromonas gingivalis, um, commonly referred to as P. gingivalis, or in some cases, just PG. As, and the name of the company, Keystone Bio, comes from the fact that the bacteria P. gingivalis is the, the keystone pathogen 
of gum disease. And there are over 10,000 research articles on P. gingivalis going back 70 plus years. We've known for a long time, it's a bad mother. You don't want this, but yet many of us have it. You know, over 50% of all adults over age 30 have some form of gum disease. Over age 65, that number goes over 80%. And P. gingivalis, the key um, virulent bacterial pathogen that drives most of these re systemic reactions. And the way that it does it is finally understood. But if you ask, you put 100 dentists in a room, I would doubt that more than one really would understand the current pathway, which um, through the work of Keystone Bio and hopefully the work that I'm doing now as their chief dental officer, um, more and more people are going to come to understand this. And, and the, the bacteria itself thrives in the mouth. It lives in the periodontal pockets of people with gum disease. Um, it's an anaerobic organism. It's very comfortable in the biofilm, in the subgingival tissues. But what the bacteria itself does is it releases loads and loads of outer membrane vesicles filled with toxic proteins that travel through the bloodstream throughout various parts of our body where it does all kinds of damage. It, uh, these these, these um, toxic proteins can cross the blood-brain barrier where they enter the brain and cause all kinds of blockage of neuronal transmission which lead to dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, they travel to the liver where they impair the body's ability to perform glycogen synthesis, which is why diabetic patients are very hard to control their insulin properly when they also concomitantly suffer with periodontal disease. We have correlation or proof uh, between P. gingivalis and digestive cancers, like oral cancer, esophage esophageal cancer, colon cancer, and colorectal cancer, and gastric. We have links with rheumatoid arthritis. We have links with um, atherosclerosis and all the associated heart attacks and strokes and whatnot. So the bottom line is the mouth is the source for this bacteria. And just going to your dentist, while that can lower the load of the bacteria PG, because an effective scaling and root planning will actually lower the load of PG for up to three weeks. A simple prophylaxis can lower the load for about a week. But the bottom line is the toxic proteins of PG are always circulating through the bloodstream and poisoning us. The only real way to heal this and cure this and stem the volume of people suffering from these maladies is to actually eradicate PG. And there's no antibiotic to get rid of it. Scaling is only temporary as it comes right back. Um, but Keystone Bio has developed a monoclonal antibody which binds to the PG and actually eradicates it. And there was actually a phase one done in the UK in 1995, believe it or not. Uh, it was a very small sample size. Only 20 patients were in the study. 10 patients got scaling and root planning and saline injections. And 10 patients got a murine or a rodent version of this monoclonal antibody back in 1995. Okay. The 10 of the patients who had the saline, in addition to scaling and root planning, PG returned almost immediately. Of the 10 patients who had the murine monoclonal antibody um, squirted into their subgingival tissues after the scaling and root planning, the earliest reported return of PG was nine months. That's wonderful. So, so Dr. Oh, go ahead. The team at KB at, at Keystone Bio 
had developed the human chimeric form of the monoclonal antibody. They've got all the intellectual property associated with it. Um, they've got drug trials for phase one safety and efficacy starting right now in Australia. And if all goes according to schedule, we could have this product in a few years, maybe 2025. And that dentists and hygienists, in addition to doing their prophylaxis and scaling and root planning, will be squirting this liquid into the pockets and probably twice a year and eradicating PG forever. Wow, that, that is absolutely wonderful to hear. If if our listeners wanted to get a hold of you, either helping them maybe with some social media issues, Facebook issues, or just wanted more information about this, how would, would be the best way for them to get a hold of you? And we'll put this into the show notes also. Yeah, so that I can be reached by email at um, drz for Dr. Z at painlessdrz.com or on my Facebook page, which is Painless Social Media. And on your on your website or on your Facebook page, people can find where you might be lecturing in the future too? Yes, my website is painlessdrz.com, but as I mentioned, I have no current date scheduled for um, live lectures, but I will, um, when I do have virtual lectures that are open to the public, I, I will put that up to um, most of my lectures that to close groups or they're marketed like for example if i'm lecturing for banco banco will advertise it um, um last week i lectured or two weeks ago i lectured for the uh baltimore county dental association so um typically groups like that will do it through their own groups um i do some study groups for you know oral surgeons and periodontists and orthodontists and whatnot that um, want to put together CE programs for their own uh, for their own referral base and whatnot. So um, if that's a kind of a closed group kind of thing, I let them do the marketing. But um, that's well, another we, way to reach me would be through my website. We might we might want to get you in front of our Academy of Dental CPA group because what you've got to say is absolutely amazing. I got a couple minutes left. I'd love to talk to you for days because you and I can you and I I think the first time we talked on the phone it was like an hour and a half. It was just wonderful. I I, I bond with people from Brooklyn for some reason better than others. I don't know why, but uh, anyway. Uh, I know that, and, and again, I don't have a lot of time, but uh, embracing technology, I know that's one of the other things you've been doing in your second career. Why is it important for dentists, especially, uh, you know, doctors who really want to grow and improve their practice? Why is why is embracing technology so important? Maybe some some thoughts on that, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. You know, there's two obvious benefits that come to mind, the actual benefits and the perceived benefits. So let me talk about perceived benefits. Um, when I was practicing in New York, um, there was a, um, an oral surgery duo that I referred the bulk of my uh, oral surgery patients to. And they ultimately had a practice divorce because one of them was much more progressive and wanted to put a lot of money into technology and the other one didn't. And, and they were both great oral surgeons. And I um, initially divvied up referrals. You know, I said, you know, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You know, you go to him Monday, Tuesday, you go to him, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I never got any negative stuff come back um, about either. Um, and, and one day I had a patient who had previously had the uh, wisdom teeth on one side of his mouth removed and and he needed the wisdom teeth on the other side removed. And I gave her the card for the surgeon that I had um, referred for the others. Um, the less technology, technologically proficient one. And um, she saw the card and she said, is there someone else you can refer us to? And I said, sure. But do you mind telling me if there was a problem with the the last time? I, I I don't have any notes indicating the healing seemed to go really well. She said he was a great doctor and and you know everything healed fine. There was no problem at all. I was just taken aback that 
coming from your office, which is so space age high tech. And I went there and he had a pump up in the air, the chair with his feet. And when we left, the uh, receptionist actually typed our receipt for us on a typewriter. I hadn't seen a typewriter. In- <laughs> I don't Smith know. Corona, probably. Yeah, when I asked to get the email receipt, the receipt emailed to me, she said, we don't do email. So I, I just, I'm sure he's a good doctor, but I'm just concerned that he's not up with the latest technology. So that's perception. Yep. Patients perceive doctors who use technology to be more proficient than doctors who don't. Yeah, you I can totally still agree. do a great crown using a copper band impression or a rubber base impression, sending out to the laboratory and sending the patient home with a temporary crown and whatnot. You can still do a great crown that way. But there's something that's a wow when the doc scans the tooth in the mouth and sends the patient home with their permanent crown the same day that they want to go and talk to their friends about it. I had this incredible experience at the dentist and whatnot. You're not going to believe what happened and whatnot. And is the care better? Maybe, but the patients certainly think it is. So, um, you know, there's no doubt that certain technologies clearly can make us super efficient. So one of the companies I'm advising now as dramatic a change as CAD CAM was for me back in 2008 to want to, um, you know, deliver same day crowns, inlays, veneers and whatnot to patients who in the past had always had, um, um, you know, had to wait with, you know, for a lab and temporaries and whatnot and get injected a second time to get numb. As great as that was, the company that I'm working with now um, is figuring out how a robot, a robotic arm, can contain the handpiece and actually do the preparation based on using artificial intelligence to produce the perfect crown preparation from a plan that we develop from the patient's you know, cone beam image that we scan of the tooth preoperatively. And what this means is that dentists in the future will know exactly what that preparation is going to look like before they, the robot has even cut the tooth. And they wow. can have the crown made up before the patient even comes into the office. <laughs> so the current workflow, if you use CAD CAM in your office, is patient comes in, they get anesthetized. Doc prepares the tooth by hand manually. Um, Doc may scan the tooth or doc may leave the operatory to go treat another patient while the assistant scans the tooth. The doc has to approve the the scan and the the virtual crown. It gets sent to a milling machine in the office where the crown gets milled in about 15 minutes. Um, Then the doc fits the crown polishes or glazes the crown in the office and then bonds it in. And the patient's in the office for about two hours. Maybe the doc has seen a couple of other patients during that time also, but it's kind of a little bit stressful and a little bit back and forth. So the future workflow is the patient comes in, the doc anesthetizes the patient, snaps the robotic arm onto the tooth, In about five minutes, the robotic arm has prepared the crown. Snap the robotic arm off. The crown is already on the bracket table because we know what the shape of the tooth is going to look like. We fit and bond the tooth. The patient's out of the office in a half hour total with their new crown. So what you're saying is I shouldn't start a dental lab today. Maybe that's not a good business model going (laughs) forward. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I wish I could talk to you. Dentists are traditionally slow to adopt technologies. When I incorporated digital radiography in 1998, I thought we'd have 
90% adoption within 10 years. And 10 years later, it was only about 25%. So it was funny. Do- Dr. David Hornbrook, I don't know if you know David. David's one of the yes, premier cosmetic dentists in the world. Yeah. And I know David really well. And I had David speak to our Academy of Dental CPA meeting in 2005. And I said, what do you think dentistry is going to look like in 10 or 15 years? He says, I think dentistry will not have to deal with impression material in 10 or 15 years. Now, we're not quite there, but we're moving that way. So, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Dr. Zuckerberg, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for your valuable time to share with our audiences. One more time, what's your what's your uh, website if they want to send you an email or, or something? Uh, my Facebook page is Painless Social Media, and the website is painlessdrz.com. If you would stay with me till after I take the the program out, I got a couple of things I got to say at the end. I'd appreciate it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was fantastic. I mean, that was a a virtual, uh, you know, what to do with social media and some some great words from someone who's got a lot of insight into the dental profession. And uh, again, not going to get much better insight into Facebook and social media. Um, Again, go to our partner, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine, www.decisionsindentistry.com. Fantastic clinical content. Uh, in fact, Dr. Zuckerberg, I, I've got to connect you with them to talk about this uh, this new product you've got. We'll have to talk about that when we get off the get off the interview. Um, www.decisionsindentistry.com. If you're looking for a dental specific CPA, uh, my mother ships the Academy of Dental CPAs www.adcpa.org, my firm, I Bailey. Uh, we handle close to a thousand dentists, do a really good job of it. And my uh, humble opinion, uh, my number is 657-279-3243. And my email is a Wiederman, W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at I'd Bailey, E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y.com. That was really fun for me to do. And this interview is fun as all mine are. We've got some great stuff coming up uh, in the next couple of months. Some really, really good stuff that's going to help you. But I want to leave you with this today. And this was a key to what Dr. Zuckerberg said, ladies and gentlemen. The key is you do not did not go to dental school just to fix people's teeth. You're about people's total health. And if you're not making your practice mission and goal to make people totally healthy, then you might want to think about changing it because as you you heard, the links between periodo- periodontal disease and, and almost every affliction you can think of, it all starts in the mouth and, and, and people don't know that. So if you're not doing that, really, you know, start doing that and stuff. I don't mean to be lecturing you, but it's, and a lot of you know this, but that's the way it goes. So anyway, Everybody, I want to thank you for the honor and the privilege of your time and listening to my podcast. We have thousands of people every month are listening to our podcast. We're getting really good results. Send me an email if there's somebody you want to hear. And with that, my name is Art Wiederman, Dental Division Director at the CPA firm of Ide Bailey, saying thank you so much for listening to the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman CPA. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. The Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast is produced by Ide Bailey in partnership with Art Wiederman, CPA, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine, and the Academy of Dental CPAs. For audience questions and feedback, email Art Wiederman, awiederman at idebailey.com. That's a W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com. Or you may call Art at 657-279-3243.